Hello, and welcome back to the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Mayer, bringing you another episode where we shine a light on the incredible people making waves in the manufacturing industry. Before we dive in, a quick reminder to check us out at our website at manufacturingculturepodcast.com. And don't forget to connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram for the latest episodes and behind the scenes content. Today, we have the honor of welcoming a truly remarkable guest, retired Lieutenant Colonel Kathy Lowry Gallowitz. Kathy is not just an award winning businesswoman, she's a trailblazer in bridging the gap between veterans and the civilian workforce. With a dynamic background that spans nearly 30 years as an Air Force officer, Kathy has firsthand experience in the power of hiring veterans. She's the mastermind behind Vanguard Veteran, where she's dedicated to coaching employers on boosting productivity and reducing turnover by creating a veteran-ready environment. Kathy's innovative approach through her Veteran Talent Academy equips employers to not just hire veterans, but to leverage their unique skill sets for mutual success. An author of Beyond Thank You for Your Service, The Veteran Champion Handbook, which is for civilians, Kathy combines her passion, her knowledge, and experience to make a lasting impact. With master's degrees in nursing and political science, she's a living testament to the diverse skill sets that veterans bring to the table. Growing up as a Navy brat and married to an Army combat veteran, Kathy's life is deeply intertwined with the military. Her work extends beyond the professional realm into volunteer faith community leadership, where she fosters military ministries to support military-connected individuals through mutual support, a sense of belonging, and spiritual resiliency. So buckle up, listeners, as we explore Kathy's journey, her insights, and the transformative work she's going to, she's doing to make the manufacturing industry and beyond more inclusive for our veterans. It's going to be an inspiring ride. Hello, Kathy. Welcome to the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. How are you doing today? Jim, I'm great, man. Thank you for that. Just very, very uh, inspiring uh, uh, introduction. Do you have your seatbelt on? That's what I want to know. I always have my seatbelt on when I record these episodes, Kathy. I am. Uh, this is something that I love to do, and yeah, I love I having that. these conversations. Wonderful. So, well, it's really good to you know further our relationship in this way. So, thank you for inviting me to be a guest. Yes, absolutely, sir. absolutely. When you and I connected originally uh, through Skill Up here in Arizona, um, and then as that uh, connection progressed, it just made a hundred percent sense to to have you on and and hear your story and talk about. Uh, your mission to to get more veterans included into the manufacturing industry. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful it, mission. It's a, it's a win-win uh, for the manufacturers, for the veterans. I would go so far as to say win-win-win for the manufacturer, the veteran, the community, the economy, da 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 da, da right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there there's so many stakeholders at, at play here, uh, especially when we're talking about veterans and, and their contributions that they can bring to well thank you jim you uh, are industry. you are a very strong veteran champion um as we've gotten to know each other on some other projects i just really am honored by your dedication to oh. helping support veterans not only in the manufacturing industry specifically but but more generally as well so right thank on you. thank you brother yeah absolutely absolutely i i it's exciting uh kathy um so Every guest tells their story. That's how we start every episode. Uh, so share your story uh, from growing up as that Navy brat to serving nearly 30 years as an Air Force officer and now leading this amazing mission-driven organization. Tell us about your story. My father was a career active Navy sailor. Okay. who did one Vietnam veteran you know, tour flying, um, but was also a communication engineer. And so I lived the life growing up, moving around the world, supporting a military uh, father. Yeah. Um, my brother actually went to Naval Academy. So I just grew up with, um, and you know, I, I went to a French-speaking preschool in Paris, France, 
graduated from high school in Keflavik, Iceland after moving in the middle of my junior year. Went to college in Munich, Germany for a year and a half, then went to three colleges and four years to get my bachelor's degree in nursing, nuclear family, and then as an Air Force officer myself. Before the age of 35, I had lived in at least 20 different communities. And wow. that's, that's just not houses. You know, I mean, in the military, <laughs> you do a lot of transitional housing and, you know, different um, aspects of your schooling and that sort of thing. But that was communities. And so, when we finally, uh, my first husband and I, my first husband was active duty Air Force. When he was ready to get out of the active duty Air Force, we settled down in a, in a, uh, a town in, in, in the Midwest, uh, a small town uh, south of Columbus, Ohio, because I wanted my, our children to have roots. I never had any roots. Yeah. And so when, um, when we finally, when, you know, I, I, when I had an opportunity to, to stay somewhere for a while, I started to learn how, <laughs> how my life was really just kind of different, you know? I mean, uh, the overseas living, the, the, the commitment to the military, um, the, the lack of long-term relationships, um, you know, just started, you know, really thinking about that and reflecting on that a lot. And so then, Years later, um, I spent the lion's share of my career in the Ohio Air National Guard. I was a nurse okay. and a public affairs officer for my career and other ancillary jobs. You know, most military <laughs> people have 16 additional duties, right? But um, so 9-11 occurred. And uh, in response to that, the adjutant general of the Ohio National Guard wanted to start a statewide outreach program to educate and engage civilians in support of troops and their families. Man, that was, when I got that job, I would have done that job for free. My strengths, my personality, what I cared about were all aligned, just perfectly aligned to, to that particular role. Having been a former CEO of a chamber of commerce, I just had a lot of the skill sets that were needed to create this never been done before outreach program with the focus of I now call civilian civilian veteran champions because up until that point, um, the the reserve component guard and reserve was pretty much a strategic reserve. They would train, 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 and not necessarily perform their military jobs. You know, in times of conflict. Yeah. Once nine eleven occurred, we were deploying right alongside our active duty brothers and sisters. So the so the the needs of our people really went up. And in particular, it focused on employers because 80% of our workforce is part-time military. And so that means they have a full-time civilian job or they're going to college to get their bachelor's degree. Sure. So okay. our employers were dramatically affected by the deployments as well. And so we wanted our, our employers to understand the value of veteran talent and to really buoy up the, the hiring and retention landscape so that employers knew how to connect with veterans. But really, you know, what, where we really still have a lot of work to do is the, is the underemployment mm. of veterans in the civilian workforce. The good news is unemployment's pretty low and consistently lower than civilian unemployment, but we still have a lot of underemployment. In, sure. in, that, in that role, just real quickly, and the book features many of the civilian veteran champions I worked alongside of, but we... Um, Employers were reached out to lawyers, healthcare providers, clergy, educators, and community leaders in general. So the book is chock full of practical strategies from all those different uh, viewpoints within society to help uh, help civilians understand how they can do small things or big things within their area of expertise that will dramatically impact quality of life, workforce and community. So Vanguard Veteran today uh, zeroes in on helping employers build a more productive workforce, in particular small to medium-sized manufacturers, and faith communities build a uh, build military ministries within their place of worship. I zeroed in on those two particular stakeholder groups because A, I thought they were critically important, and B, I mean, they just make a, an, an incredible impact on the veterans' quality of life and there's much to be gained for the employers and the faith communities as well. Yeah. So, so I think that's a, a pretty reasonable summary. Um, one, one, one more point. I, I did have the opportunity when I was part-time military to start a healthcare practice and had, saw firsthand 
how the veterans that we hired were undeniably the backbone of our economy, boy, of, of the of the of the company, not our economy, but of our company. Yeah. Because their work ethic, their perseverance, their attitudes, I mean, their get her done attitudes, you know, and as a small business, we had 25 employees, we were hitting it hard. We had a high volume <laughs> orthopedic surgery practice. And um, they just came on board our two two key veterans in two key roles. And you know, really just um, helped us succeed in a very short period of time. And so we had a big sense of gratitude to them. But, you know, if veterans can do that in, in that in that company, I mean, we, the research shows that they do it in, in all different kinds of industries. Absolutely. Absolutely. Their their contribution is, is paramount. And, uh, you know, I think that concept of being underemployed, right? They Veterans develop such unique skill sets while employed by the military on one hand, but on the other hand, they bring, they are given skill sets that do easily translate to the, the civilian world. Mm -hmm. um, but oftentimes they come out of their service and they're, they're not able to find uh, employment that truly meets that potential and that skill set. There's just disconnects, you know, and the, yeah. one of the, one of the largest one is culture. Okay. And, and some of the, 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 the largest cultural nuggets that kind of get in the way are the, um, our, our communication styles are oftentimes very different. Military people can yeah. be very direct, very succinct, maybe, maybe not do a lot of small talk. Um, <laughs> oh, you, you agree with that? I do. Uh, That's absolutely. Funny. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm not the, the typical GI, right? I'm a middle-aged woman who was a nurse in a public affairs. I wasn't in the infantry. I didn't go to combat. And so that's not me, but right. you know, that, that, but that's an important point. You know, it, it's, it's, diff, it's hard to, or let's say it's not ideal to generalize to veterans because you meet one veteran, you really met one, one. veteran, right? Yeah. But when the lion's share of Military members are male, and the lion share, you know, kind of join um, right out of high school. There are some generalizations that that probably fit. So, um, communication styles, um, and then the, the the structure that we're used to in the military that is, you know, very different uh, uh, in, in civilian life. Uh, the teamwork aspect, you know, when you're in the military. You know, you, you dress alike, you look alike, you have the same values, you have the same training, right. you might eat at the same chow halls, you might sleep in the same base. You, you know, I mean, the you you are really, really indoctrinated with the sense of teamwork and taking care of your brothers and sisters. And it means yeah. a lot to us, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then we lose that camaraderie when we get out and the sense of um, of helping each other and uh, teamwork is, you know, very different in, in civilian yeah. life. You know, it's not. It's not, you know, really bad, but it's the, the, the intensity of it, the seriousness of it, the focus of it, it is different. And so that's that's really important to us, too. And and then um, kind of the the other piece is that um, when we're in the military, we must put the needs of the military first. It, you know, I can't remember how many times as a child growing up, moving all over the place. My dad would say, well, it's the needs of the military or you hear that <laughs> oftentimes with assignments. Right. Well, the needs in the military are X, Y, and Z. It doesn't really matter what you want. Sometimes right. you may have a say, but your say is much less important than the needs of the military. And so you're used to putting yourself, you know, putting yourself second. But yeah. when you come out of the military, you may not have such a strong handle on, okay, well, what am I really good at? What mm. do I really want to do? And oftentimes yeah. we excel best. When we're placed in areas of our strengths, that's what John Maxwell, leadership trainer, teaches us. And I believe it. If yeah. you're working in the areas of your strength, it's just an automatic fit versus working in areas of your weakness where, you know, it's a struggle. So yeah. people come out of the military oftentimes not really knowing for sure what they want to do. And that makes it very difficult for them to you know, really find their niche and to advocate for themselves. And then one more small, uh, yeah. small piece is that military people fundamentally believe that there's no I in team. Okay. So they don't know how to self promote. Okay. They, 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 they're just not good at it. They need yeah, help during the interview sense. to, 
and they need to be coached to know how to advocate for themselves in an interview and really kind of dig deep into understand what they do have to offer and um, how they can sort of um, leverage their military experience in ways that civilian people can understand. Sure. That makes sense. There's a lot of disconnects. That makes total sense. Uh, Talking about coaching, Kathy, you you coach employers on becoming veteran ready and and creating those veteran talent strategies, right? Um, Can you explain to the listeners what being veteran ready means and why it's important for companies, especially in the manufacturing industry. I mean, you, you touched on, on that cultural piece, right? And we talk on this podcast and I talk with my clients about culture being that alignment of values between the employer and the organization. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about uh, being veteran ready. I'd like to start off by saying what's in the manufacturer's best interest or why should manufacturers hire veterans? Well, first and foremost, um, they have a safety mindset, okay? Yeah. Operational discipline. Um, love small unit integrity. And so those, you know, those, those, um, those groups on the machine or the production line, um, you know, they're well suited to kind of manage that. Yeah. Natural leaders, calm under pressure, um, technical aptitudes, okay? I mean, the... Uh, I see the manufacturing setting as an ideal place, an ideal um, match. Um, you know, it, 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 it's almost like a wedding, you know, I mean, <laughs> it, it, I mean, it just has so much potential um, sure. that manufacturers will really benefit from uh, investing in and leveraging. Yeah. Okay. And so the second part of your question is, um, what is veteran ready and why is that important? Well, the business case for hiring veterans is very well understood because, as mentioned earlier, unemployment is is consistently lower than civilian unemployment, and employers are hiring veterans in record numbers. It's a beautiful thing. More and more organizations, uh, government, nonprofit, uh, for profit, are um, really uh, uh, advancing the opportunity for employers of all industries to hire veterans. That's good news sure. story. Yeah. Um, and, and so more and more employers get that, you know, veterans are hard workers and they show up on time and they're team players and leaders. And so, um, they're veteran friendly, veteran mm. friendly. Yeah. I love those. I love those veterans. They're great yeah. workers. Let's get them on board. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's great, but there's so much more to being a, uh, a prepared employer who will be able to leverage their skill set. So being veteran ready is really, I like to call it an architect, someone who kind of has a blueprint, right? Yeah. Now blueprint, you know, implies everything's perfect. And, you know, it, it, it can never be when you're building culture and hiring and retaining people. It, yeah. It's it's all kind of messy. And, you know, you have to have, you have to, you know, have trial and error and you have to adapt, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, uh, veteran ready employers have systems in place. So that they have metrics in place, they have a mm. commitment from their from their C suite. Lo- they have a long haul commitment to you know making veteran hiring work. They understand what's in it for them. They yeah. have veteran employee resource groups so that they're engaging their veteran hires. They are connecting their veteran hires. They're looking at their onboarding processes to make sure that you know the veteran feels welcome the day before, you know, before they even start and that they are, you know, being monitored, if you will, and tracked and they're getting, you know, timely feedback and they're feeling, a, you know, a sense of belonging. Um, they, they have messaging that, mm-hmm. that really resonates with this population. They use pictures and words and, you know, they know where to go reach the veteran population, uh, mm-hmm. the, the service specific programs that, that they offer for those who are transitioning or, you know, veteran oriented programs or state run programs. There's so many ways to connect with sources of veteran talent, but because the demand for veteran talent is so high, um, it's really important that companies have a proactive strategy to build relationships with sources of veteran talent and build trusting relationships so that there's top of mind awareness for that employer so that When your needs go up, you know, X, Y, or Z source of veteran talent already knows you, kind of understands your, the kind of jobs you have, you know, likes you, 
Um, you know, and, and you, you, you had, you've had more than one, you know, one introduction, I, ideally several, yeah. and because, you know, that, that's what really works in, in life is when you have, you know, uh, consistent ongoing relationships with people who, who understand each other and, and can provide you with talent. Yeah. So it's a, um, a, a veteran talent strategy includes external relationship building with sources of talent, veteran talent. Mm -hmm. as well as distinguishing the company as veteran friendly in the local veteran community, if not, if not national, nationally, okay. right. Um, but to show up, support veteran causes because, oh, by the way, it's been found that that is an effective retention strategy for your current veteran hires. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So, so the veteran talent strategy involves external relationship management with sources and potential community partners. Right. Yeah. And then the and then looking at the internal processes, be it talent acquisition. Do they know how to use military skills translators? Do they know how to interview well? Do they know how to get the the, the candidate talking and really assess their skills well? Okay. Yeah. Military skills translators are a huge part of it. What about human resources? Right. Um, is, do you want to have a hiring preference for hiring veterans? Are you taking advantage of WOTC, the Workforce Occup uh, Opportunity Tax Credit? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what other creative kind of benefit structures could you offer uh, veterans? Then you need, you know, social media to, you know, really reach veterans where they're at. Yeah. Um, and, you know, engaging your veteran hires as external talent ambassadors. At the end of the day, that's really what's going to help you recruit more and more. Because if yeah. your veterans believe in your company and your culture, they're going to bring their brothers and sisters along with them. That's just that's just how people are, you know. So, so is there a, a segment of manufacturing? I mean, I know that I work with some companies in the the aerospace, the defense uh, segment of the manufacturing industry, right? And I know that those uh, companies are typically very willing and engaged with the veteran community. Um, so I, I would imagine that they fit well into those organizations, but I don't want to pigeonhole uh, our right. veterans into that, well, right? Because I'm sure that there are some that are very passionate about medical devices and very right. passionate about uh, food or textile manufacturing or robotics or automation, right? Is there a segment of manufacturing that they fit better or? I don't really have a good answer for that, but uh, I believe the answer is no. I believe based on the, um, how, how easy we are to train, yeah. Okay. And the technical aptitudes that we bring. I mean, we, we train and train and train and train and train some more. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's, that's what makes the United States military the most powerful military in the world, because we are so serious about training our people. Okay. Yeah. And then you train some more, right. And then you keep and going. You, yeah. And then you keep it current. And so it's, 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 um, it's very, reasonable to take someone with a little bit of technical aptitude and teach them uh, what you want them to learn in your particular industry. The thing that I want to highlight is that the larger companies typically, you know, have more resources or have more awareness or have, you know, have more veterans already in their workforce. And so sure. they tend to be the, the more active ones that hire the veterans because they're more aware or because they have more resources. Okay. But a lot of veterans, I think, enjoy working in smaller companies. So the small to medium size, I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of, you know, untapped resources in the small to medium size manufacturers yeah. because, um, I mean, mil military people can tend to get lost in, in big civilian unstructured organizations Makes sense. Um, and so, I mean, that's what you see in other kinds of industries is the larger corporations really hitting this hard yeah. and the smaller uh, companies being a little bit more timid or uncertain because they don't know where to get started. Um, and, you know, they, they have less time or energy to deal with it. But it, yeah. it doesn't take a lot of time or energy. It just takes somebody who's uh, committed to kind of spearheading it. And then, and then ideally someone uh, that comes alongside them to point the way. And that's what yeah. Vanguard Veteran does is points the way. Great. So 
Tell us a little bit more about the Veteran Talent Academy. Does that differ from getting companies veteran ready for for uh, the the it, veterans coming into the workforce? I, I offer this as sort of an introduction to what it's all about, right? Okay. Uh, twice a year, there are um, two, three-hour training sessions. The first one focuses on attraction. The, the one in September focuses in on retention. And so you are learning best practices um, um, from either standpoint yeah. that, that you can uh, a- adapt and, and implement on your own Got it. Um, as, as sort of a, uh, a starting place. But, but certainly the, the way it works ideally and best is if you commit to developing strategy um, yeah. and you know, working with someone who can, who, can, who can make it easy for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kathy, you wrote a book. Uh, I have not read the book yet. Uh, I hope to get a copy of it and, uh, and, and read it. Um, but it's called Beyond. Uh, thank you for your service. And it's the, the veteran champion handbook. Uh, and it's, it's geared towards civilians, uh, like myself and, and a lot of people out there. Um, having not read it, what are some key takeaways from the book, uh, that can help civilians better understand and support veterans in the workplace in any industry? Okay. There are just scads of practical strategies that you can use from any standpoint in society, regardless of, you know, kind of what your role is. But I'd kind of like to use you as a as sort of okay. a test, a testimony, if you will. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, I said thank you to you for being a civilian veteran champion. Have you ever had anybody else? Thank you. Thank you nope. for that. That is yeah. the first time. Okay. And have you ever even thought about yourself in terms of that? No, not until you said it, but then it, it kind of started resonating yes. with me and and uh, I realized that I do like to champion veteran causes. I do like to promote them and uh, bring people like yourself onto to this platform to talk well, about this. Well, and in some of the community service organizations that you've worked with, right? you are have already been doing stuff to help veterans. But right. now, based on our relationship, our connections, our partnership, right. you are doing more and more just because you're more aware, yeah. right? And because someone like me comes alongside you, said, "Jim, hey, buddy, we need your help," right? <laughs> and, and you yeah. said, "And you said, pick me." We're you know we're we're working on a project now that yeah. you know hopefully will be very exciting and 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 helpful for manufacturers and for veterans. And so absolutely, this is what cultivating civilian veteran champions is all about: Got is it. identifying people that care, right? Mm-hmm. Identifying people that have certain kinds of expertise. Yep, and you know. And it makes sense for them. There's, there's oftentimes there really needs to be a mutual benefit, which is good. That's the way the world works, right? Yeah. You have certain goals and maybe some of your nonprofits or you have goals based on your business or based yep. on your assessment of the needs of the community. And then you say, oh, yeah, veterans, they're right there. You know, I haven't thought about this in this way, right? Well, that's where the rub is. That's what the problem is. Absolutely. Is it, is it the, whose responsibility is it? Whose job is it? Do we have an industry or an agency or a service that says, okay, here's our veterans. We could be doing more. How can I help you, encourage you, praise you, reinforce you, reward yeah. you for, for doing those sorts of things? And yeah. um, this, this isn't rocket science. It's just, you know, most of us go along our lives dealing with the demands in front of us, right? And unless we're aware and involved and engaged and frankly appreciated, Yep. Right. Absolutely. You know, appreciated if somebody said, hey, you know, thank you. So what I love to do, I mean, I've uh, um, I've been a, a, a John Maxwell leadership speaker, trainer, coach for many years and okay. host, hosted an event called Live to Lead and it and um, and this this uh, and, and other events. And so any event that I get involved in, I try to create opportunities to present certificates of appreciation to veteran champions. I now, love it. There's a lot of great organizations and it's particularly in Arizona um, who do recognize uh, patriots. It's, it's what, what, what it's called here in Arizona. And so there's, there is some of that definitely going on, but um, my grassroots uh, purpose is to connect with people like you who have a willingness and interest and in understanding to really bolster and expand 
your potential to help you and to help the veterans. And so that's, that, that's what the book is really all about is just, you know, everyday civilians. And then there's some, then there's some, you know, higher powered, like an Ohio Supreme Court justice and what she could do from her standpoint, mm -hmm. or there's, or there's a physician from the Ohio State Medical Association who took information to the American Medical Association, or there's, you know, there's small employers and big employers, kind of where they are at in their journey. And, um, you know, and, and it's not rocket science, it's people science, and everybody <laughs> can do something. Everybody can do something. It doesn't have to be something major. But I'm be that the down. change. I love your sign in the background there. Be yeah. the change you want to see in the world. And we really need civilians who um, can, you know, tweak their processes a little bit, engage with the veteran community, care about the veteran community, learn a little bit more about the veteran community and make things better through their lens um, to improve quality of life, workforce and community. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. And I love that it's not rocket science, it's people science. That that could be the quote of the episode. I'm going to definitely have to isolate that one. And, and Good, I love it too. That. Yeah, that's a great one. I made that um, up. That, you did great on that Thank one. Thank you. Um, Kathy, what are some of the most... Uh, Kathy, what are some of the biggest challenges and, and uh, conversely, some of the biz biggest successes you've encountered uh, along this journey uh, with Vanguard Veterans? Um, challenges. I think there's a lot of competition for uh, and to build awareness, especially now in this era of diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, my my bias and my concern a little bit is that the needs of veterans will kind of lower down uh, maybe to, as compared to some of the needs of some of the other um, groups in our society that are seeking uh, stronger and stronger voices. Yeah. Um, because again, veterans, number one, are not self, are not help seeking kinds of people. They don't, they, they don't like to ask for help. Number mm -hmm. two, they don't like to self-promote, okay? So we need to keep our eyes on the ball and, you know, take care of our veterans. And I'm not just talking about veterans' benefits. I'm talking about harnessing the potential of veterans in the workforce. Sure. We as a society need to see our veterans as not broken, but civic and workforce assets. That's yeah. one of the biggest challenges right there because you say the word veteran and what comes to mind more often than not is somebody with a baseball cap who um, is, you know, probably 70 or 80 years old. That's what kind of the, the idea of a veteran is. Right. But the idea of a veteran is someone who served for 20 years and is now 40 and is a ready, you know, has a lot of work life left in him or her right? Yeah. or someone who served four to six years and is, you know, the height of their, you know, youth, their a young adult life and has a huge amount of work life in front of them. Yeah. And those individuals, men and women come with a strong purpose, a desire to serve, you know, um, wanting to belong. Uh, I mean, they just are great, great, great workers. And so, uh, the mindset and the paradigm of, helping veterans become great workers and be those great workers, I think is, is, is still sort of a fundamental, you yeah. know, kind of working against also some of the sensationalism in the media, you know, not all veterans have PTSD. Right. Some do. Okay. The VA says about 20% of Afghanistan and um, Iraq veterans have post-traumatic stress disorder, but even if they do, we can learn to manage our lives, manage our triggers, and be great employees. Now, when, as I understand it, as a as a nurse, about two thirds of our society experiences trauma, right? Two thirds of us, okay. Yep. And so you, you're more likely when when one percent of our society serves, you're more likely to meet a civilian with undiagnosed PTSD or diagnosed PTSD, yeah. and um. You know, so, you know, in this era of mental health awareness, uh, you know, we need to accommodate, you know, yeah. you know, these are great workers that deserve accommodation and support because of what, frankly, they've done for our nation in particular, you know, those who have, who have potentially been to combat. Right. Yeah. 
Awesome. Um, so Kathy, uh, looking ahead, what kind of goals do you have for Vanguard veteran and, and how do you hope and expect to continue making an impact in not only the manufacturing industry, but beyond? Well, I will continue to work employment based projects with manufacturing, with other manufacturing partners to build awareness about the value of veteran talent within manufacturing yeah. to um, help employers build veteran talent, uh, veteran talent strategies. Um, other goals I have is working, trying to develop legislation in the state of Arizona to potentially attract more veterans to the state, Great. to potentially get more employer education rolling, okay? Um, and my other goals are I'm working with some of the judges in Arizona who run veteran treatment courts to try to get more veteran treatment courts, um, you know, rolling or under or known. Uh, and so that's an exciting initiative and one that, um, I, I did some work with and supported an Ohio Supreme court judge in, um, in Ohio with. Uh, and then, you know, continuing to build my military ministry in Fountain Hills so that um, we can be available to help, you know, promote that connection, sense of belonging and helping others, helping other veterans or others who love our military to build military ministries within their congregations. Veteran Talent Academy is going to be a great place for employers to engage early on and kind of get an assessment of, of what it's all about. Yeah. Um, but, you know, really helping employers build that veteran talent uh, strategy is is really going to move the dial for manufacturers and other employers. Wonderful. Wonderful. I love it, Kathy. Uh, Kathy, last question. I ask all of my guests this question because I typically forget to ask things and or, or uh, space out on, on some things sometimes. What haven't I asked you that uh, you want to share with the audience today? Nothing is too small for you to do for a veteran or a military connected person in your community, at your workplace, or at your place of worship. It all really centers on <clears throat> building a trusting relationship. Yes, we appreciate. Thank you for your service. We appreciate. Thank you for your service and sacrifice. We appreciate. Thank you for wearing your uniform. But this really all goes beyond words into actions. Yeah. So be on the lookout for people in your neighborhood, at work, in your place of worship. <clears throat> Are they getting ready to deploy? Yeah. Um, you know, is the family being left at home? If so, how can you support that neighbor? How can you stay connected to that deployed service members in your workforce? Sure. How can you help them feel more connected as a new hire? Are you assigning them a civilian and a military buddy, so to speak? I like right? it. Uh, how can you support veterans out in the community? But I really like people to think about how you can build a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a veteran. Mm. Build that personal relationship. And in, in particular, for women, right? Yeah. Us girls, we feel... We feel kind of left out when 15% of us are female, female veterans, you know. Yeah. So think about this, okay? Here's, here's just a real practical story. Yeah. So my husband's an Army combat veteran, and I'm a Air Force veteran, right? Both mm -hmm. career officers, right? My husband's six foot two, big gregarious personality. We go out socializing or just meet anybody walking down the street. Yeah. And, the, and, and military comes up, and who do you think they turn to to talk about military? Right. They don't turn to me. They turn to him. Right? right. And so us girls tend to feel kind of isolated, forgotten. And so um, just be sensitive to the fact that military people feel disconnected. Mm -hmm. Guys feel disconnected from mainstream America when they leave military service. How Got do you it. think us girls feel? Yeah. So go, go out of your way to go beyond words and with your actions, develop personal relationships, personal trusting relationships, and through that, improving their quality of life or your workforce or your community. I absolutely love it, Kathy. Thank you so much for being on today. I really appreciate 
your time, uh, your efforts, your energy, uh, and and what you and Vanguard are bringing, not only to to the manufacturing industry as far as you know education of how we can incorporate this population into our our, our businesses, but uh, society as a whole, our communities as a whole. It's very much appreciated, and and I look forward to working with you and. By the time this is released, hopefully we will have something fun and big to announce to yeah. everybody in some of yeah. these promos. And and maybe we'll even record a second promo video just for right. that event. Well, um, I, I appreciate you being a civilian veteran champion. And to anybody who's listening, I invite you also to join the veteran champion movement and be a part of the win. We need you. Absolutely. All right, folks, uh, that wraps up another fantastic episode of the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. Again, a huge thank you to our incredible guest, retired Lieutenant Colonel Kathy Lowry Gallowitz, for sharing her journey and the impactful work being done at Vanguard Veteran. It's clear that mission-driven organizations like hers are making a significant difference in the manufacturing industry and beyond. Don't forget to visit us at manufacturingculturepodcast.com to catch up on this episode and all of our past episodes. You can also connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and even TikTok if I get on there to stay updated on all things manufacturing and culture related. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with your friends, your colleagues, and anyone who might appreciate these uh, fascinating stories from the world of manufacturing. And we'd love it if you would take a moment to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast platform, wherever you're listening to this right now, go into the show and hit five stars. And if, for, if you're listening to this episode and, and you're rating and reviewing, uh, write, uh, it's not rocket science, it's uh, people science in, in the comments there. It's not for me. It's not for my ego. It What it does when you rate and review the show is it, makes us more exposed and, and it brings us to the top of the charts so more people find the show. Uh, so really would appreciate you doing that. Your feedback, uh, as always, helps us reach more listeners and, and also helps continue to bring this kind of content to you. So folks, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time on the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. Have a great day and keep making things.